Looks like we're live. Okay, sounds good. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to call the April 13th board meeting to order. First up is roll call. Melinda. Present. Camera. Present. And I'm Dan Cobb. I am present. Uh, Jeff Phelps is excused this evening, so it'll just be the three of us. David. I work with Jeff Phelps. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, David, thank you. Um, okay, minutes approval. First up is the February 9th Planning Board regular meeting minutes. Does anyone have any comments or corrections to that meeting? Do we need to approve them one by one or shall we approve them in the um, we could do them separately because I was not going to vote on the second one since I wasn't there. That's a good point. I, mean, I can vote to approve it, but I guess it doesn't really matter. <laughs> That's fine. I have we some comments on the workshop one if you are bundling them. Let's, let's just do them together. That's fine. Okay. Um, so nothing on February 9th. How about March 9th? I wasn't there, so I don't have any comments yeah. on it. Uh, I did have a, a question about the workshop one. I recall that we did talk about, um, there was a, one of us, one of the planning board raised the question as to whether or not reducing the size of the building would change the envelope, and they told us no, and that wasn't mentioned in the, the document, and I thought that was important, and so worth noting. Okay, yep. reducing the envelope, and they said no. They said it didn't make a difference in the, um, the impact on the buffer. Okay. Obviously, it would change the size of the building, but there were other considerations that we discussed. You know, we get into that, but yep. that was my um, one thought on the work that workshop. Okay, I'll add that back. I, I my, my only comments, and I don't, I don't know actually, for the best of folks can help me with this tonight. Actually, we had a participant there who's a resident. I didn't have her last name. I'd like to add it if I can catch up with you guys before you leave or get it via email. Cindy. Cindy, I actually have her last name. Oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Um, and then the other thing, just clarifying that it's a workshop and there were discussion and then there were a couple of references where you guys are referred to as counselor. Mm -hmm. So I think our uh, system was getting issues with the council meetings too. So yeah. I'm just gonna have it as clerical edit, not substantive. But. Okay. Thanks. Tamara, do you have anything? No, no issues. Okay, um, do we have a motion to approve as corrected? I would like to move the <coughs> minutes from those two meetings approved as corrected. Second. Uh, all in favor? That's three nothing. Okay. Uh, information exchange. Looks like we've got five items. Kristen, I'll let you take it away. Sure. Um, it, the first step would be that there's the adjust, adjustment to the agenda that the here the public hearing on accessory dwelling units um, is going to be tabled because the town council tabled the item at the April. Four meeting, so that's going to be moved forward to after the council hears it again with amendments. Just as, as a heads up, if anyone is here for that tonight, um, the staff review committee convened to review two minor site plan applications on March 29th. So the up update on that: uh, one is for a garage on the IFNW property, and the second for the development of the residential lot in the Lewiston Road subdivision, the one with the self storage. Um, if you recall, lot number one was residential next to the storage buildings and had some provisions from the approval that required that uh, it was reviewed again at the staff review committee level. Uh, well placements remaining the same at this time, not, not major changes, so that uh, was okay as well. Um, there are some other pending pieces to getting the building permit, but it's um, underway. Um, project update, the self-storage site on Portland Road was the other one that was effectively uh, green lighted to move forward despite the moratorium. There were those two, the one in Lewiston and the, the one on Portland Road. One of the conditions uh, of that was that there was an automatic six month extension granted as long as he sh submitted a letter regarding the need for that extension and he has done so. So I just wanted to update the board that that six month extension is validly in place right now and he believes he can get it done by the end of the year and if he can't, he's aware that he needs to come back before you for a year extension. Uh, and that is a new owner as well, just so you're aware. 
Um, then the other piece is the solar site off of Hillcrest Drive, off Yarmouth Road, uh, is underway. We had a pre-construction meeting, and that is, uh, the, those steps are in place. They're aware of what needs to be done, and we're all in touch, and they're going to start work this spring, summer. Um, and then zoning ordinance, just keeping you updated. The shed setbacks that you reviewed and the updates to the planning board fees, both are now in effect. Mm -hmm. So we've been past the 30-day approval period. Um, again, the accessory dwelling unit, um, hopefully we can speak about that tonight. The council had tabled that, uh, and Dan can certainly speak to that more, re regarding the square footage uh, maximum. The state law allows the town to put a cap on the maximum square footage of an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and there was some disagreement about what that should be. So we're bringing it back to council on the 18th. Uh, and that memo related to that is before you just now, it just got finished today. So uh, putting that before you tonight was staff's recommendation on the cap for square footage and hoping we might be able to get planning board input um, so you can weigh in on the, on the council's decision on Tuesday, hopeful decision on Tuesday. Um, so that's where we are with that. And the self storage ordinance is up before you for public hearing tonight. Um, and as an FYI, the, there's a non-substantive change to come into compliance with state law regarding use of the word cannabis instead of marijuana throughout the zoning and shoreland zoning, and the council has been handling that. Because it's not substantive, it does not need to come before you as a board uh, as a land use change. It's just a language change, so, but wanted you to be aware of that. Um, and the town manager wants you to be aware that you are all invited to attend the Build Main Conference. I would like you to consider that. So if you're interested, please let me know. We'll get you signed up through the town. And a reminder uh, where the council is discussing planning board stipends, if you have not done so already, to contact the finance director with uh, additional information to uh, make sure she can get you into the system to get, get paid. I, I know Council McGuire might have an update for us on, the, on where that's at. I'm, you want me to go now? Yeah, that's it for me. Um, as far as the stipends are concerned, there was a budget hearing at the last council meeting. Uh, it was very well intended, attended. It was a very good conversation, actually. Um, there was a lot of good back and forth. Um, as a result of the input from that night, the, after the crowd left, actually, the, the council cut $50,000 from the budget, which uh, means the operation budget will only increase fifty thousand dollars. That is the reason it's so low is because there is a projected one point two or three million dollar increase in revenue next year. Um, so some of those numbers are still to be finalized. The audit is due to be presented to the council at our first meeting in May, and the council voted to pass the budget last night, which does include. The stipend as we talked about before for planning boards and alternates when we get them um, and if you have, unless you have any other questions that's all I have nope okay and was that all you had Kristen yes unless you had any questions on any of that either. Uh, nope I don't think so um, board have any information to exchange the only thing I just have a question in terms of I did go to the resiliency um, <clears throat> workshop um, and there is a follow-up um, workshop that is planned it was, though it was meant to be this past weekend and they tabled it they postponed it um, to provide more um, time for planning but that's actually bringing together Durham New Gloucester and Gray mm -hmm. to be looking at um, uh, planning for climate resiliency wow. and so it definitely would be something of interest to planning board members um, w when is it I haven't gotten the date for the new. Oh, gotcha. I just know. I just heard that it was postponed. Okay. But they haven't set a date yet. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Sounds good. Thank you. So that's it for information exchange. Um, next up then is new business. First up is an extension request from Avesta Housing. This is a request by Avesta Housing, represented by Maureen McGlone of Ransom Engineering for a one-year extension of the project's June 9, 2022 site plan approval for the 26-unit multifamily senior housing development located near 16 Hancock Street, tax map 43, lot 405-39 in the Village Center Zoning District owned by Gray Senior Housing. I think I saw a representative here.
Welcome. Hi there. Maureen McGlone from Ransom Consulting. And since Kristen said I would be up here, I guess I'll, I will come up. With me is uh, also a slew of folks from Avesta. Uh, so um, yes, we are looking to, um, uh, we're requesting an extension of the application um, to, what did you say in your letter, Kyle? To June? Oh, a one-year extension. Okay, thank you. Okay, and yeah, we've got your letter, and I'm sure we've all read it, so I'll save you from rehashing the history. I, I doubt it's going to be an issue. Um, any questions from the board? Okay, um, so I guess I think we can just go ahead. I don't have any problem with that either. I think uh, we all were aware of the challenges that you've had, and it's not like you've just been sitting idle, not you know, <laughs> trying, to make, <laughs> trying to make efforts. So. I would really love to be sitting idle, but no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if someone wants to go ahead and make that motion, I think we can okay. get that one done. <laughs> I move we approve the extension for request from Avesta Housing. Um, do I have to read well, this? Well, yeah, there's, oh, there's I, a, I missed the whole a draft motion. You should just read no, that. It's Oh, I've got it. You You've got it. Yep. Okay, go for it. There you I go. move to approve a one-year extension of the June 9, 2022 site plan approval for the Avesta Metaview 226-unit multifamily senior housing development submitted by Avesta Housing, represented by Maureen McGlone of Ransom Engineering, located near 16 Hancock Street, tax map 43, lot 405-39, in the Village Center Zoning District owned by Gray Senior Housing, Inc., subject to the following conditions all prior applicable standards and condition of approval remain in effect. The planning board will require a submittal of amended plans for additional review process to address the elements of the June 9th, 2022 site plan approval that cannot be met and to review related amendments to the subdivision plan. Is there a second? I second. Any discussion? All in favor? Got your one-year extension. Boy, I'd love to have a win. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up is public hearings. And we have uh, first one is to review proposed changes to zoning ordinance chapter 402 with regards to self-storage facilities. Proposed changes include adding an ordinance section on self-storage facility standards editing the self-storage definition, updating table 402.5.3 regarding zoning district uses, adding design standards, and adding language referencing self-storage. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this? Scott Liberty. Um, this is the fourth public hearing uh, that uh, I've attended uh, with a, a group of, uh, I would say, a couple dozen people. There's no people here tonight because they've decided that it doesn't matter what they say, that the council is going to fall back on the comprehensive plan. Out of the three prior um, public hearings and the uh, zoning, uh, zoning Ordinance Review Committee, not a single person from the public has come out to support the council's uh, proposed ordinance. Yet the council says they don't need to come out because we have the comprehensive plan. So it doesn't matter if you guys come out um, and speak where we have a mandate. So that has now, uh, left the group disgruntled and uh, they've got a lawyer. I'm part of the group. Uh, they have a meeting scheduled uh, for the 26th of this month at the True Value and they're moving forward with a citizen's initiative to um, undo whatever gets passed. And not only undo it, uh, so, but to make a prohibition that the council can't change the ordinance for a period of five years. I brought this up to them, to the council, and I said, this isn't give and take. Uh, you gotta give something on the 300 feet. 300 feet is a football field, and you're not taking into consideration 
property that's already been developed on along the road. There's a lot of property that's been developed on the road. For example, the old Valley Engineering across from the car wash. That's only about 175 feet deep. So if someone wanted to develop behind Valley Engineering, they would still have to go another 125 feet back. It's just a waste of property. I'll give another example, Gray Meadows Junkyard. I mean, come on, you're coming into the town of Gray. Um, it's kind of the first thing you see when you come to the town of Gray, and they're right on Route 100. So let's say I had a chance to buy that property, and I wanted to do a multi-million dollar um, storage facility. You're telling me I can't clean up Gray Meadows um, Junkyard and do a self-storage facility? I gotta be 300 feet back? Well, the problem is 300 feet back put you in the river. You, so, so that property is just taken off the market. And then the other thing they've done in here, we don't know if one of them's legal or not, but <clears throat> they've put in here that the planning board has no wiggle room. That's legal. But they've also put in the Zoning Board of Appeals has no wiggle room. That we're not sure is legal. Zoning Board of Appeals is a separate branch of government where you go to appeal for hardship, where you go to appeal for different things. So they're just making sure, the council's making sure there's no way this thing's gonna get unraveled. They're forcing us to do a citizen's initiative. And, and I, I would be dishonest to stand up here and say, this isn't good for me. This ordinance is good for me. I mean, I've got mine, and I've got a monopoly now. Uh, I've talked to Michael Pride uh, at length. Uh, he's actually has made offers to buy mine. If I haven't accepted. Um, so for me, it's good. And not only do I have a monopoly, I have the only uh, climate control property my seer auction. It's the only property that can be climate control in this ordinance. Because if you read the ordinance, it says that uh, it has to uh, directly abut an existing self-storage facility as of March 1st, 2023. Well, that's me. So here, Brad Pollard came and he told, he, he said, look, I got coal farms. I'm having a hard time with it. I can't do anything with it. Ceilings are low. You know, the church, who knows if they're going to survive upstairs. And he was led to believe that he was included in this, but he doesn't buy a self-storage facility. So here we are. I don't see any. I don't think anyone's going to speak. I know Lonnie's not going to speak out in favor of the ordinance. So this is the fourth public hearing. Not a single person has spoken in favor of it, and dozens of people have spoken against it. And um, again, I, I had met with Dan, and I told him. Uh, I, I, we spoke, and he, I got everything I wanted. But I said to him, if they don't give something on the 300 feet, it's kind of like being in, a, in a, an army platoon. I'm with the platoon. Um, so I'm with the group. I'm going to see this through, um, even if it's to my detriment. So, uh, um, but if they did something on the 300 feet, be reasonable. Give them something. Then, I, I, then I, I'm out at that point because I, I, I don't want to spend my weekends at the dump collecting signatures. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi there, <clears throat> Lonnie Humphrey. Um, I've attended quite a few meetings too, like Scotty, the hearings and the workshops and different things. And there's been you know, a good group of people here, 10, 15 people from the town, guys that all own businesses in the town, carpenters, plumbers, hardware stores, hot dog stands. I mean, just people that have made up this community for a lot of years. I mean, our parents went to school here. We graduated from here. We just didn't show up from Boston to develop gray or something like that. It's not like we sneaking in and trying to fly under the radar and build a hundred minute storage buildings around. Um, you know, they, they made a cut back a little on the buffers on the side or something, but 300 feet setback from the frontage is just taking so much useful land up. I mean, I own a few lots in gray and one of them has 700 feet of frontage and if I want to build many storages, it's a 10-acre lot. I lose 500 
Um, I use, lose just about five acres along the front. So if you go 700 feet of frontage times 300 feet, well, that's cut my lot in half. And then you take your side buffers, and then you figure in if there's a little dip, nook, or cranny, and you get into the engineering and stuff, you've just lost so much useful land that it's not even worth it. And not saying that I was really looking to build a mini storage tomorrow, but I've bought and paid taxes on this property along with, you know, the gravel pit owners, companies, everybody that was here does business in gray and is worried about the community and our investments. And none of us are here to do shortfalls or to hurt the town of gray. We're here to have the communities survive and do well, and we've all made our living here. But we've made this community what it is. A lot of the people that were here, our parents and grandparents, have all owned businesses and done different things. And I don't think the council heard a thing that we said, not a thing. And we, well, they said, well, we shortened up the buffers on the side. Well, that don't, you know, help me with 700 feet of frontage and 300 foot setbacks. And the setbacks were what, 10 feet previous? So go 10 to 300 feet, give me a break. I mean, let's go 50 feet, 75 feet, like there is for homes or other businesses. But 300, I mean, just trying to hide them out in the back 40. And, you know, what do you think muffin shops and bed and breakfast is going to build along the roadsides? It just doesn't appear that way in gray. And it's not going to be a quaint little community in Main Street. I know they're watching out for the future, but there's a ton of people here that really have meant a lot to this town and done a lot in this town over a lot of years. And it's just like, you might as well have stayed home. And I mean, I wish I did. I got, I got five grandkids and a, and a great wife, and I could have stayed home with them evenings and not come down here and felt like, you know, all for what. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's everyone in the audience. So thank you guys. Appreciate the comments and, and the uh, paying attention to what's going on in town. Um, anything from the board? I think we have two people online. I don't know if they want to Oh, speak. sorry. Uh, um, just throwing it out there. Yeah. Uh, I'll offer it out to people online if anyone has their hand raised. I don't see any hands no? raised. Okay. All right. Thank you. So um, with that, then I'll close the public hearing and um, offer up for the board if they have any comments. Um, I, it, it does seem like the scope of these requirements is going to mean that no other self-storage units are constructed in the town. They are significant. Um, and I do um, appreciate that I haven't participated in all the public hearings, but I was, at, I was present for the last one that was the public planning board held, and I appreciate these two members of the public speaking. Um, 300 feet is quite deep, and I. I also know that there is a desire to develop our road frontage in different ways than, you know, we want different kinds of commercial establishments than that. And I, um, comprehensive plans are created with a lot of input. And I don't think that, um, I would be very hesitant to dismiss a comprehensive plan um, and an ordinance that is trying to stay consistent with that. Um, but it is curious that there isn't uh, members of the public haven't spoken in favor of, of this at all and everyone has apparently and I don't know haven't participated in all of them but um, that is interesting that no one seems to be in favor of these but the, but the comprehensive plan speaks to what the public is interested in as well so um, it would be uh, I would be interested to hear um, from the representative from the town council to hear kind of their thinking on that and anything, um, and the rest of the planning board, because I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled um, right now, because this seems like this, this ordinance would officially not, they wouldn't happen, I think, is the realistic fact of things. Okay, thank you. Tamara? Yeah, I likewise was curious that the 300 didn't shift at all um and i also um and thank you for coming out tonight and providing your input um appreciate that 
and um, and I, I guess for me, I'm not surprised that people aren't coming out in support. People rarely come out in support. They yeah, only ever come enough. out with negatives, so that's <laughs> just kind of human nature. Um, I, I did note under the general standards, um, E general standards number two, I just found that language confusing. It like it read to me as if it's the minimum size for the for the storage unit as opposed to the minimum size for the parcel, but um, but that just might be me. Um, I also uh, just wanted to note, I can't help my stormwater um, <laughs> things, um, the outdoor self-storage standards um, number four, it talks about the reporting only as it um, relates to contamination of the soil and, um, and any adverse effect to the groundwater, but it doesn't actually talk about the actual function of the stormwater system. And so um, it just feels like if you're going to require an annual report in terms of these things, then knowing that it's actually dealing with the volume of the water and that that is still functioning as designed would be um, important. So those were my thoughts. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I don't have any new comments on the ordinance itself that I didn't already make last time. Um, I will say, um, I guess I'm sad is probably the best description of it that um, we have. And I, I uh, by the way, I've had several calls that came in um, from Scott's called me a couple times, Lonnie, I think Rod, I have gotten several calls from uh, folks kind of expressing concerns and asking what's happening. And I guess what makes me sad is these are all uh, kind of long time prominent business people that are doing business in town. And we often here at the planning board, we mostly see people from out of town. They come in, they do their development and they're gone. Um, and the concern that was expressed to me by all of these gentlemen was that they weren't feeling heard. And we heard it again tonight that they feel like they're not being heard. Um, so that I guess makes me sad that they're feeling that way. These are, you know, people that are out to be here long term. So there's that. Um, I guess the other piece, uh, I wouldn't read much into trying to assume that, you know, every, everyone agrees because they must have supported the comprehensive plan because it exists. So therefore, nobody speaking means everyone else agrees except for the two people that showed up. I, I don't really buy into that. I think there's a few people that are passionate about it and they've taken time out of their days and evenings to um, to be heard. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not a lot more people that are also against it and probably most people are completely unaware of it or don't care but I wouldn't assume that they're in favor of it um, automatically because of a you know relying on a comprehensive plan. So that's, um, I guess, my other comment. I don't, like I said, I don't have anything specific to the d dimensions or anything like that that I haven't already mentioned, but um, I just kind of feel like this is going towards a, a sad outcome one way or the other that I wish it didn't have to go there, but it sounds like it is. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. I think this is more a question for staff. So um, we've public hearing has happened, you know, we've, we've said some things. Um, ultimately, the decision is the town council as to what this will be or not be, um, because that's their job. So um, I'm just curious if there's, is that, that's basically what happens here, as this public hearing closes and then the town council will decide whatever they decide and the public will do whatever they do. Is that the next steps in all of this? The, the process we've been dealing with with ordinances that we usually, if there's an issue that comes up, we workshop yeah. it. We get council input on where they'd like us to go. Yeah. We draft it. It comes usually back back to council for another workshop. Make yeah. sure the language is what meets their policy decisions, mm -hmm. and then we go through the statutory land use uh, right. process, which is it goes to council for first read. It comes here, mm -hmm. public hearings both places, and then yeah. it comes back to council for a second read and approval. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the ADU one, like you saw, there were things that didn't match up that they put put it on the table and we bring it back to the drawing board and then start the process over again. Um, this one, um, 
that had happened, actually. That had already happened. Mm -hmm. It came to public hearing the first time, mm -hmm. uh, got stopped up, made a bunch of changes, and now this is the second time around. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Councilor McGuire wanted to speak to that, too. Did you want to speak to that? I'm well, sorry. You I think he's waiting for me to acknowledge him, which I, which I will. I just want to make sure yeah. you were done. Um, this is the process. Okay. So did that answered your question? Yes, did the you. board have um, any other comments? I just have one more question, and I apologize if this was covered in one of the meetings. I didn't go back to all the meetings. Um, how does this compare to like neighboring towns? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm just curious what, what exploration of that has occurred. The land use hearing, like the hearing process for changing a land use ordinance is state statute. No, just in terms of like the 300 foot setback for oh. like ha those kind of standards. I don't know. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't just know. curious. I don't know. My understanding was the council's goal was other development in the front for a gray. Okay. I don't know what other towns are doing. We can certainly look, look into it. But. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? That is it. Um, so, you. yeah, you're welcome. So normally I probably would have had you speak during public hearing, but um, I think it's a good opportunity here that, Dan, you can probably provide some context. Uh, so I'd be happy to open it up to you to perhaps answer any of the two questions that were, that were asked. Yeah, I think that I can. Um, to piggyback on Kristen's um, explanation of the process, a lot of times an ordinance will bounce against first reading and if there's a substantive change it'll go back and it'll come to the council for another first reading and it may do that two or three times i think in this case it's actually done it three but it may be only two once we finally get to the point where we're not making any substantive changes then it comes to the planning board for your review um, the other question about does this exist in any other town i don't know exactly i do know in the town of manchester uh, up near Augusta, there is a facility that's built very much like this ordinance proposes um, that's set back a good 300 feet, if not further, from uh, 202, um, which would allow for the land in front of it to be developed into some other uh, commercial um, or depending on the use, the zoning, whatever the uses would be available. Um, the original idea was driven it, it, for the most part, because of the comp plan, because there is only a certain amount of space in our commercial zones as they exist today in our mixed use zones, because that in fact is also gonna change in the future, uh, which is also another condition of the comp plan. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things that are important. I think we need to separate, or I would encourage people to separate whether or not they've been listened to, to whether or not someone just doesn't agree. We all listen to each other. We all take into account what people say. We don't disregard it or disrespect anyone. But in the end, different people will come draw different conclusions and disagree. And it certainly happens to me on the council a lot, and it happens on anybody that has to make decisions. Um, the council did make changes, significant changes to the ordinance, but clearly not the main one that's important to this particular group. Um, I've heard also conversations that it's dis dis divisive and that it splits the community. And the, the process that's being proposed to change the ordinance isn't divisive. It's another mechanism in our town government that allows people who disagree with the decisions of the people that are elected to make the decisions, it gives them another opportunity to gather up enough uh, votes to undo what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that as divisive. I see that as part of the process. I'll be honest with you, when we make decisions on the council, we are often in a vacuum. People don't come out. The last budget, I wish every meeting that we had was like the last budget meeting we had Tuesday. We must have had 40 people in this room and we talked a lot and we heard a lot and ultimately we made some changes to the budget as a result of that input. Um, so I don't see it as being a big divisive piece. I understand people are disappointed with the council and they don't like the decision that we've made. Um, but there is reason behind the decision um, and there is a, there is a long-term goal. Um, we understand that people have investments in their property. Um, putting a 
self-storage facility further back on a lot that is big enough in order to do that doesn't mean that the person's lost the commercial value of the property that's still on Main Street. Um, so there's a difference of opinion in how that's going to be decided, I can't tell you. I have heard more clearly tonight, and I, and I may have been told this in the past and just didn't hear it, that if it was 275, we might be happy with it. Um, I haven't heard any sort of specific um, um, alternate ideas that were, or I haven't heard any ideas that were that specific. The, the goal, with the help of the planning department, was to make sure that there was a viable lot in front of the self storage unit that would be able to use, um, be used for for another purpose. We we don't have a sewage system. Sewage uh, septic and and stormwater currently has to be handled on this on the property. In order to do that, you need to allow for a certain amount of land. Um, if it's a on a property that's not on public water, then you also have to contend with a well. So there are a lot of competing interests there. I think as the comprehensive plan gets refined and the zoning changes and some of these other things change, when some of the infrastructure changes that the council's working on now, it may change this rule. One of the things we're working on is MDOT's project to replace the storm drain system down Main Street in its entirety. One of the things the council's looking at is providing enough capacity in that system so that businesses that locate along that system can use the system for their stormwater. That will significantly change the, what they can do with their property. It will give them a lot more um, opportunities because they won't have to handle stormwater on their own property. But that's you know, that is two or three years down the road. So um, I'm glad to hear that there may be a specific number out there. I don't know it, what the number is that makes that front lot viable or not viable, but um, the council can, in fact, at the second reading, decide that they want to make a change and restart the whole process. So I, 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 right now, with the information that we had at our last meeting, the straw poll was the majority of the council was in favor of keeping it as it is. Um, I think that covers all the questions I heard. I don't. Um, the other heard. question was if uh, what other surrounding communities are doing regarding self storage, and <laughs> is this um, well, I think completely I different? That. We don't. We don't. I don't. I can't tell you that. It wasn't designed based on what we found in other communities, though we did find the example that I mentioned, and we based it more on the goals from the comp plan. And I have a question about around that one that you mentioned um, in Manchester, I think it was. Was that so? That there's a big difference between allowing someone to do something or requiring them to do it. Do you know if does Manchester require I don't know people if, to do that, that, or did they system. allow them to do it? I don't know. Can't answer that. It's the example that made some of us think it's a good idea. Okay, I guess, I mean, any other comments from anyone? I just have one question sure, about Manchester. Is the, is the front parcel in front of that Manchester unit developed at all? No, it's not, no. not at this time. Or well, it wasn't the last time I went by there. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay, glad to else? answer any other questions. Um, anything else? I guess the only other, uh, I guess I would feel like when we're making ordinances, I guess I, I, I'm surprised that we don't have the pulse of what surrounding communities are doing. Not that we always or ever have to do the same thing, but I would at least think that we would be informed by what they're doing. We, when, well, I, um, I don't know if you get the minutes from OAC's meetings. I was on the Ordinance Advisory Committee for a, for a number of years. Um, almost always our ordinance works starts with a sweep of what folks are doing around us. But again, in this particular instance, 
we're responding to a situation that we don't necessarily think exists in other places. So that was kind of the, the driver of that. Okay. One sure, go ahead. Sorry. It just <laughs> occurred to me. Um, the one thing, and I, I hear the town council's desire and the comprehensive plans um, stated intention to really encourage different kinds of de development in front, you know, right abutting um, the roads. And I, I get that. I, I'm, I'm hearing that. And I also recognize that, you know, the comprehensive plan is not necessarily agreed upon by everyone in the town, but it, it goes through a pretty robust process and it speaks to that. The one thing that um, I am curious about in this um, proposal is the constraints on existing reuse because um, to the extent that you could re you know adapt an existing use and a building that already exists and, and use it for storage or something because sometimes buildings are funky and they're difficult to reuse mm -hmm. um, the the impact of these requirements on existing structures seems um, seems like it would almost restrict the ability to reuse a building and um, you know, there's encouragement to try and get different kinds of development, and there's like, well, there's some buildings that just exist and they're hard to reuse. You know, they're low build, low ceilings, or whatever. Um, and so uh, that that seems like um, I, I guess that's one thing that I again haven't participated in all these public hearings, so I don't have the benefit of all of that. But I um, uh, that one is it gives me pause, and I just want to kind of get on the record that that seems like. Um, the ability to reuse a building in lots of flexible ways helps preserve buildings from going deteriorate because they, you know, it's hard to get the reuse done. So um, that's that's something that I think mm -hmm. is is worth noting here. Um, anyway, that's all. there's there's one thing I would encourage. The comp plan is a huge document, but the first 25 pages of it are sort of the executive summary and really gives you a good sense of everything that's behind it. Um, which is all the data that was collected to basically write that piece. Um, the principal group who the council hired to, uh, pardon me, it was North Star group that we hired to uh, help us with the comp plan, held multiple meetings over the course of the summer. They were at the Blue Ray Festival. They had uh, day-long um, sort of opportunities for people to come and you know, throw things against the board, so to speak, and, and talk about their ideas. And well over 200 different people attended those various meetings in town. So, you know, 200 is not 8,800 either, but it's a fairly big turnout compared to what we're used to getting. Um, over 65% of the people voted for the comp plan as it was presented, which was one of the largest four votes that we've had in recent history. Um, certainly in the six years that I've been on the council. So it does carry a certain amount of weight. And, and as I said, as a councilor or as a planning board member, to a lesser extent, because you guys have more um, directions to follow, if you will, because you have the ordinances, um, I will readily admit that I wish that people came out more often um, because we do often have to um, go with our gut. We have a group of people that have come out. Clearly, they don't like this particular ordinance. Um, and I appreciate that. I don't disrespect anyone who has a different opinion. Um, but there is a reason why we want to do it the way we do it. And we do feel that we're supporting the document that all those people wanted. So there's give and take. And if we make the wrong decision and these folks go forward with their referendum, um, it may change. And if that happens, I'll be okay with that because that's what most people want. But I'm comfortable with my support for it right now. And again, I think as we talk about things that feel contentious, I think it's important to us that we don't speak in generalities, that we speak in specifics so that we don't make decisions where there is a misunderstanding or there's a lack of understanding that maybe there was a solution there that no one communicated or fully recognized. Whether that happens with this ordinance, I can't tell you, but I'm certainly gonna take all this back to the, in fact, what I'll do is I'll ask the counselors to watch this meeting mm -hmm. and see where that conversation goes from here. 
Okay. Sounds good. Um, I guess the only other thing I'll say, and it's it's really only anecdotal, but um, it's related. I often hear Gray is a difficult town to do business in. So you're nodding ahead, so you've heard it. Oh, I've heard it, it for right? long before I got on the council. So, it's our reputation. So it's our reputation. And I guess all I'll say is my radar is up when several long-term local business people are up in arms about an ordinance. Like, that, that just makes me have pause. Like, okay, um, we have this reputation for being difficult to do business within. We need to change that somehow. Like, that's the last thing that we want a reputation for. And if local business people are displeased with something that the council's doing, I guess it just, it would give me a lot of pause that whether it's the right direction or not, I guess. I think that like, um, like people, people will draw conclusions from what they hear or what they experience. Um, I can't really tell you if Gray is a harder place to do business than anybody else, to be honest with you. Um, I don't have any firsthand experience. What I do know is that when people aren't allowed to use their land the way they want, <coughs> they're going to not be happy about that. And one of the things that we struggle with is that each of us owns our own property, and each of us would like to control that and do whatever we want. And I certainly respect that. But I live next to someone else, and they live next to someone else. And what I do with my property affects the value of what, for most of us, is our most valuable physical possession, the land we own, the house we own. So as a community, we have to find a way to have conversation. And there has to be some give and take, because if it just everybody can do what they want with their property, that can have a negative impact on their neighbor's value. And is that fair? So it is a complicated mix and and it, there is give and take and so that's why I think these discussions are good they don't have to be divisive we can disagree and have conversations mm -hmm. and talk about why we feel the why we have made the decision we've made and change each other's minds sometimes and sometimes we're not going to change each other's minds and we've got to get to a point where we can agree to disagree and move on because revisiting the same thing over and over again certainly isn't going to help anybody anywhere so um that maybe was a little long-winded, but I, I think that um, it's it's not unreasonable. I go back to the example, and I think Scott was the one that filled me out. I thought there used to be five gas stations in the village, but I've heard there might have been as many as seven at one point in time. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is make sure people have access to the services that they want but also allow for the development of other services that we don't have. And so there is, there is pressure against those two things. Mm -hmm. And how this, you know, if are we gonna be able to find a middle ground here? I, I can't promise that we will, but we should keep talking about it and we'll see. And if the council ultimately makes a decision that this group doesn't like, um, they have every right in the world to go out and try and convince the rest of the voters that we are all wet and it needs to change. The only thing that I feel is a little sad is that the, the five-year moratorium part, but that's up to that group to decide. I mean, that, that feels almost like a punishment, mm -hmm. but I understand <laughs> there's a lot of motion involved in this and uh, we'll just have to see where it goes. Maybe we'll be able to, to uh, reach some agreement, but I, one counselor and I have no authority unless I can convince two other people okay. to agree with me. Okay, um, so I think we'll close it out unless the board's got anything else to end with. All right, um, good conversation. Thanks again for coming out, yes. appreciate it. Thank you, John. Um, okay, so I'm gonna close this public hearing. And um, I guess, do we need to table we, do we need to table the other one, I guess? I think formally, yes, and then if we can have some discussion around it, I'd like to get some planning board input for the council um, regarding the square footage, which so, kind of brief you on, but yes, I think right, it's well, probably- we need to table the public hearing. Yep, see you later. To table the public Thank hearing you. first, yeah. So, uh, 
Does someone want to table the public hearing? Mr. Chairman, I, I move we table the public hearing for the accessory dwelling unit ordinance changes. I second that. And any discussion? All in favor? It's three nothing, so it will be tabled until uh, council does their thing and it comes back to us. That's right. Um, so I guess you wanted to add an agenda item to? Um, yeah, related to that, if uh, you guys are open to that, I left you a, a memo that's gonna be going before the council on Tuesday. Um, it was, the issue was tabled due to some disagreement about, or lack of clarity on what the maximum um, square footage should be for an accessory dwelling unit. So the code officer and planning director and uh, staff, we put together this memo the staff's recommendation is that the accessory dwelling unit remain at 660 square feet, which is what it is now for accessory apartment. Uh, that's based off of um, a two-car garage, roughly, like having an apartment above a two-car garage sort of building. Um, and the reasons for that are, are laid out in that, in that memo. Um, we had heard some input from the council that was not uh, particularly clear directive, so we had, we had talked, they had talked about some higher square footage, and so we had come back with 800 for that first read um, at council on April 4, um, and that was not uh, agreeable, so that's why it was tabled. So we're looking for input from the planning board uh, tonight to bring to council on Tuesday mm -hmm. on what your thoughts are for uh, a cap for square footage. Keeping in mind, they're just some of the salient points in that memo have to do with um, there are other parts of LD two thousand three that we'll be putting into into play. This is the first part um, that we're trying to show that we're working toward compliance, mm -hmm. and this was um, our attorney had suggested we start with this one because it's kind of the low hanging fruit, if you will, the easier piece uh, to implement, and uh, so that's why we're trying to move forward with this and get it on the books by the statutory deadline. Um, so there are pieces that are going to address uh, increased density in the form of a, like a, a full regular dwelling unit as opposed to an accessory dwelling unit. So this is very specific to accessory dwelling units, which is part of why OI staff is advocating to remain at the 660. Uh, and one of the other salient points that Codes was making is that um, there could be uh, additional living space where these could become quite large. And that, that's why that's laid out for you in the memo. Um, the higher you go with square footage, there could be additional floors, there could be finished basement, finished attic. Uh, get into some quite large structures um, where, again, where the council was talking about abutters, uh, there's that impact where you're thinking accessory dwelling unit, um, then it might have turned into something larger than what's, what's in your head when you hear that term. Um, so that, that's kind of where, where staff was coming from, uh, throwing out those figures so you have an idea of what a average like small ranch would be, um, what a current accessory apartment is in our ordinance, uh, and so on. So sharing that with you and looking for your input on okay. what you think is appropriate. Thanks. I have, uh, before we get started, I have one question, um, which I've got, I had a couple comments that I picked up on, but um, can you describe what in this is um, required by state law and what, and what changes are at the council's pleasure? Because it's a big question. Well, <laughs> There's an well, entire but, but, ordinance well, that's the, in the council. Let me packet. tell you why I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> because basically, there's no point in giving anyone feedback about something that's required by state law. Right. So the only and part so, of that required by state law is the minimum. There is a minimum square footage living space, and that's 190, I believe. And that's in the in the ordinance that's gone before the draft ordinance. Well, what about the maximum time? is up to the town to set if they want to. Okay. The town does not have to set a maximum, but they can. What about all the other changes, though? All the other changes in the ADU ordinance are oh. outlined in the council packet um, and as part of ours tonight for the public but hearing we're they... supposed to have. They're extensive. We can go through right. them all if you'd like. But right, but my question is, are all those changes required by state law or some of them, none of them? Uh, most of the changes we're making are related to state law. Um, I believe, believe all of them, yeah. and others is it's clean up language to, to make it match. Okay. 
I, mean, I guess I'll just give my. Yeah. We can go through it piece by piece, but the piece that was that was holding it up was a square footage cap. Okay. If you want to I'll go just, through the rest of it, I'm happy no, to. No, no. I thought I was hoping to save time, but I'll just give you my two comments, and that will be faster. <laughs> <laughs> it's our understanding. It's just the upper square footage is really our only. Yeah. It's the hold up, right? Yeah. Well, and really the only thing that we have any say over. So, okay, well, I'll give my comment anyway. So it'll be shorter than my <laughs> attempt to save time. Um, the thing that stood out to me was why uh, there's no off street parking required for an accelerated state. It's not allowed, state. Not allowed to. Yeah. Yeah. So, where is that person supposed to park on, on the, the street? street? You'll be seeing the street ordinance in the future because <laughs> of the ADU yeah. law. Ask the legislature. Okay. Yeah, I'm so, we're that, as baffled as anyone that made else. No sense to, because for uh, for the house for a duplex, yeah, you have to have whatever it was, one point three, one point two five. Yeah, but for an ADU, the law was written that we could not in any way require okay. off street parking, which is madness. In That's our ridiculous. But, yeah, I agree. Um, so I'll give yeah I'll give my feedback on the other one because I I'm glad that you. The other thing that immediately jumped out at me was the 800 square feet, and I was like, wow, that's huge. That's like the size of a small cabin. Um, and I was going to ask, you know, where that came from and why. I 100% agree with the staff um, recommendation to keep it at 660, and I 100% agree with their uh, reasoning behind it. So those are my two comments. Anybody else? I see. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I was it, I was likewise um, uh, struck by the 800, so I appreciate the six the 660. Um, and I don't think that I had that many other comments. Yeah, I was curious. It it felt like it was all just required by the state. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we actually had to update the the grid about parking to eliminate. Right. Yeah, uh, I did see that. Yeah, reference. So I'm going to be a little bit of an outlier here. That's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, my understanding of the reason for the state law in the first place is to try and facilitate um, more affordable housing and right. allowing people to rent to their kid, let their parents live there, let other people, family members, extended, you know, whatever, um, who may or may not even have a car or what, you know, there's there's a lot of different kinds of people who might be in an accessory dwelling. And um, opening this up uh, is giving that that giving more of those options out there and creating some flexibility. And many many towns are adamantly um, opposed to accessory dwelling accessory dwellings and are very restrictive to it. They're also very restrictive of duplexes or two or three units. Like like it's gonna you know destroy the value of the town and um, and the result is not enough affordable housing. So. Um, while the an 800 might sound, my house is actually not that much bigger than that. So I, I have a tiny, pretty small house, um, just two bedrooms. But you know, if you had a family, having two bedrooms, I mean, 660 is probably not two bedrooms. It's probably one. It's pretty small. Um, and uh, the 800, when I first saw that, I was like, oh, nice. Like you could actually have a family could live there. Um, you know, you know, you could have. Yeah, parents, they could have their kid and their grandkid live there, and if it was only 660, it, that wouldn't be possible. So I actually liked the 800. I thought that it was small enough that it wouldn't be like an entire, you know, depending on the size of the property and the uh, capacity, I think you're going to have natural restrictions based on water and sewer and some other things like that. Um, for example, I don't think that my septic system is big enough to hold. I'm not even sure it could hold 660. Um, so if I wanted to have an accessory dwelling unit and have my son <laughs> boomerang himself back and live over a garage I might build, like I'd need to expand it, and, and that would be appropriate. So I actually am okay with the 800, um, but I do appreciate uh, the, the considerations of, of everyone um, that is providing input here, and I wouldn't be wouldn't vote against 660, but I, I actually think that 800 is a is a decent compromise, and I wouldn't have a problem with it personally. Um, and uh, when it comes to the off street parking, um, that would be hard to rent. I would say if you have no off street parking, so I think that might kind of fix itself. Um, and 
and uh, in certain towns, and again, the state law was for all, there are certain towns that there's ample um, off-street parking, and that's not gray, but um, that's probably where that came from as they were trying to address that. It's the one size fits all, and of course it doesn't, but anyway, those are my thoughts okay. on that. I guess just you know, in response, I'll say where I was coming from with the 660 that I think it makes sense to keep it is sort of around the idea of keeping it an accessory, right? And and not like a, a dual unit mm -hmm. because you could theoretically have two 800 square foot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that you could have, you know, if, if you extended this further, you could have a bigger accessory dwelling unit th than the principal residence. Oh, that piece is capped. Is it capped? In our current language yeah, is capped, okay. just to clarify. But yes, but, it, it, it could essentially turn any single family home lot into a duplex effectively, right? Right. If, you, mm -hmm. if you go to a certain point. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 um, I would remain in favor of the 660, I think. There's no, no reason to change that right now. I'd keep it where it is. Oh, there was one sure, one ahead. thought that I had about that because, it, and I'm not exactly I don't have a garage at all, so that, that in law part it's not coming anytime soon. Um, but I know when I I once had some dreams about an apart a, a garage, and I thought. Um, about like a one and a half and now cars are big and people like to do other things in garages so a lot of garages are not strictly two car so I don't know what like a two and a half is but that was the other thing that I thought of I'm like guess what how, how big would that mean would it mean if you had a two and a half like it seems like 660 is for a two car garage so that was another thought that um, uh, but the concept of it being accessory like an add-on I get that and I and I can mm -hmm. see how the Keeping it to 660, which is why I'm, I'm, I, I'm totally, I understand where you're coming from, but I also would be okay with, um, as long as it was smaller than the primary dwelling, I think that's what makes it more accessory in my mind anyway. But okay. Okay. Yeah, right now the language says no larger than the, prim the primary. Yeah. And the, the 660 was just their, the two car garage comparison, just to yeah. understand where does 660 come from at all, right. like where are they pulling this out of? Yeah. There is that 190 minimum in the state law, mm -hmm. so effectively if you had a one and a half car garage and wanted to build one above that, yeah. as long as it was at least 190 square feet of living space, yeah. you could build it. Yeah. It mm -hmm. wouldn't be 660, it would be smaller. Right. It would be right. a studio, basically. Right. But it would be allowed, because right. it well, meets the minimum. 190, is, that's almost is the size of our new shed ordinance, which is 160. <laughs> So anyway, it's yeah. barely, it's yeah, barely it's larger than that. Yeah. So I think a one and a half car garage would, would be okay since that ordinance was designed to prevent a one car garage. <laughs> yeah. It's a New York City <laughs> studio. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of other changes. I'm happy to go yeah. through them with you guys if you want to go through yeah. them. Um, but yeah, most of it, it is to bring it into compliance with state law. One of the big changes for Gray is that this proposes to allow an accessory dwelling unit in a detached structure, right. whereas right now you have to be attached to the mm -hmm. primary. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big changes. But one of the other big things that's pointed out in the memo too is the owner occupied, and the, that is remaining in the proposed mm -hmm. ordinance as well. Yeah. That was a good piece. Yes. Did you have something? It sounded like you had. I did, and now I just lost it. Isn't that great? <laughs> if I may. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> the board. The board is done. I'm, I'm done. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh. But just a point of information: these are really horrible oh. microphones. So if you don't speak into them, <laughs> they're going to be yeah. lip reading on the video, I'm yep. afraid. Um, the council was all over the chart. Interestingly enough, part of the conversation of this was, well, how much do we restrict someone from using their property the way they want, which is similar to the conversation we had there. So the council kind of went all over the map. One of them was no bigger than the existing structure. One was an 1,100 square feet. I think 1,000 was discussed. Um, so I think everybody's trying to wrap their hands around this. The thing about this that worries me, like many things, unfortunately, that come from Augusta these days, is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. They write, they, they create laws before they write the rules. And so, which I, if, there, if, if I was going to have a constitutional amendment, it's that you've got to write the rules before you can vote on the law, because 
you know, the intent, you might agree with the intent of the law, but when the rules come out, you might go, oh my God, why did I vote for that? Anyways, sorry, that's my short editorial. <laughs> um, I think that the 660 felt like a, a cautionary step in that we can always change it to make it bigger when we understand the rest of it. There are follow-on effects, though. I have already heard someone, a senior, who has applied to cap their property taxes, who's going to build an ADU on their property for one of their children, and their property taxes won't go up because their property taxes, their property taxes are capped. Now the state promises us that they'll pay us the difference between the cap and whatever it would be valued at. But I'll be honest with you, I have very little faith in the state from, from one year to the next, because it changes depending on how tough things are in Augusta. So um, we're really stuck. And so I appreciate the fact that we're sort of being cautious about it. Um, uh, and so I frankly was kind of, well, you know, it's their property, we have to do it. You know, let them make it bigger. It shouldn't be any bigger than the house. But after listening to the discussion tonight, I confess I'm more down on the 660 end now than I was before. Um, you're exactly right, I think. Your septic system is going to govern the entire conversation. And septic systems are based on the number of bedrooms in your house. And if you're going to add a structure with more bedrooms, then you're, very few people will spend the money to build an oversized septic system. So that is a limiting factor. We are worried about the parking. It's just going to be a pain because we're going to have to make a parking ordinance. Public Works is going to be towing cars in the winter that are left on the side of the road because they can't plow the road. So I, I disagree. But anyways, uh, it's good to hear this conversation. You guys are kind of somewhat divided like the council, I think. <laughs> so I'm not sure where it will end up, but it's you know, glad to have been able to listen to your conversation. Okay. May I? Go ahead. Uh, it came back to me. I wrote right. it down this time. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I did really appreciate, Melinda, your, your perspective and hearing that. Just um, And I'm still, the piece that I'm stuck on in regards to even going larger um, is the, if you have the language being no larger than the primary structure, you could, you know, we see what happens, right? You know, the primary structure could be 800 square feet and then the accessory is 799, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so like, it feels like it needs to be in, I don't know, in relation to the primary structure mm -hmm. in, in, you know? Um, and then the other piece that I did dig into, but I'm forgetting now in terms of um, this is just, um, we have, you know, shoreline zoning. And so like, it, so, what does this mean in terms of accessory dwellings? No, not sure that. zoning is, is outside of this. Okay, Everything great. Shoreline zoning I continues thought to that apply. I, okay. Yep. Okay, oh, that's because, good. yes, that's yeah, because. Uh, well, yeah, I guess that depends on the point of view, but. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, when we want to protect the water quality of our, you know. Yes, but if you can protect the water quality, why shouldn't you be able to put an ADU on your property? I mean, it depends on your lot size, right, and the circumstances of the land, and so. But if you're within the shoreline zone, there's a greater chance that you're going to have an impact on water quality. But if you can prove that you can do it, <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> if you can prove you can maintain the water quality, then why would you limit someone from being able to create an ADU? I mean, th that's what feels somewhat arbitrary to me about the law. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to do it except shoreline zone. So anyways, sorry, that was, I butted in. You can tell I've put, I've, this, this one has my attention too. Got some, got some feelings about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sweet. So I think yeah. that's it Thank then. You. So we'll close out that discussion. And I think that was our bonus agenda item. So if somebody wanted to. Replacement agenda. The bonus round. <laughs> if somebody would like to have a motion to adjourn, I'd happily motion. entertain that. I motion we adjourn. Second. All in favor? It's three nothing. We'll adjourn at eight, 11.